Hi, good morning. I'm so glad you came. I was worried no one would show up in this weather. So, whoa. I'm glad you're okay. Good. Um, so, just a, a couple of announcements, questions that I received via email. A um, few, um, few things before we jump into the material. Um, first of all, I was asked, so who is this class for? Um, is it for people, you know, it's positive psychology, only for people who are very happy? Is it only for people who are depressed? Is it, who is who's this class for? Well, the class is for anyone who's interested in positive psychology and anyone who wants to be happier. If you're extremely happy, you can still be happier. If you're very unhappy, you can still be happier. So the class essentially is for everyone who's interested in the material, and I would add someone who's interested to, to work, to put the kind of effort that we talked about last time, which is not the kind of effort that would require you to you know, just wreck your head about understanding a certain concept, but it is effort in terms of applying these ideas to your lives. Now, you may want to take this class because you're interested on an academic level in positive psychology. That's perfectly fine. And you will get many, we'll talk about numerous studies in every lecture starting next time. We'll talk about study after study after study. So you'll get that element as well. However, if you're thinking about taking positive psychology for personal benefit, you'd need to put the effort in. And, and I'll talk more about that today. So the class is for everyone, anyone who's extremely happy and wants to be happier, anyone who's not happy and wants to be happier. Um, pass, fail, perfectly fine. Again, the, the, the idea about this class is it's first and foremost for you. So I would urge you, if you do take it pass fail, to put in the work. And that's why the one element of pass fail which is not negotiable is that all the response papers have to be submitted. Now, the response papers, as you know, are not graded. They're basically reflection papers where you reflect about ideas, about things that can be applied to your life. But they're required. So you hand them in, you pass, you don't hand them in, you fail. But other than that, um, by all means, if you want to take the class pass-fail, that's perfectly fine. Third thing, you'll be exposed to many theories, to many ideas in, in this class. Not everything will resonate with you. There's a, a wonderful book that just came out in 2008, just two weeks ago, called The How of Happiness by Sonia Lubomirsky. And um, there she talks about the concept. She's a professor at Riverside, a Harvard College graduate, then went to Stanford for grad school. Um, she talks about the importance of finding fit, meaning the fit between a certain technique or a tool or an idea and yourself. Not every idea, not every study that you that you hear about, not every intervention that you actually practice, and you will practice interventions in your life, whether it's doing acts of kindness, whether it's expressing gratitude, whether it's um, exercise, physical exercising, whether it's journaling, you will do all these things throughout the semester. Not everything will be right for you. You'll be exposed to it, you will try it, and then you'll make up your mind, yes, this is what I want to incorporate, or no, you know, this is just not relevant for me. So it's important to keep that in mind. Everything that I talk about is backed by research, but the research doesn't say that it's right for everyone. It says that for most people or for many people, this has worked or it is working. So again, be an active participant in this class as opposed to a passive recipient of, of a doctrine and identify the things that work for you. Not everything, guaranteed, not everything will work for you, but a lot of things will. Um, your response papers that I just mentioned earlier, they're due uh, at 5 p.m. They'll be, sorry, you'll get them 5 p.m. on Tuesday, starting next Tuesday, and they'll be due um, 5 p.m. on Sunday to your TF. Again, the response papers are usually, for most people, fun, interesting, and engaging activities, as you know, not graded, just basically for you to reflect, for you to grow, to grow through them. Um, Thesis writers. How many thesis writers? Just so I get a show of hand here. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> um, no, thesis writers, um, you will not need to take the midterm. 
um, I know you're, it's, it's crunch time around that time, you know, been through it myself here. So you will not have to take the midterm and your final will count for, um, for more. Unless you want to take the midterm, of course, you're, you're more than welcome to. We won't throw you out of the classroom. Though your thesis advisor may. Um, there'll be many announcements on, um, online. So do check the website on a regular basis. We'll communicate a lot of things. Instead of sending you emails, we'll have the announcement there. So che check them you know, regularly about you know, six, seven times a day. Just kidding. You know, once a day or once every two days um, is, is more than enough. Um, I'd like to, before I do jump into the material, and we have a very exciting lecture today, um, to invite Deb Levy, who is the uh, head TF for the Extension School. So Extension School um, students, I know there are a couple of you here, those of you at home. Um, here she is, Deb Levy. <laughs> All right, well, I have about 20, 30 minutes to talk, so I'm going to start with my um, childhood. I just kidding. <laughs> All right, so I won't be, I am the head TF for the Extension School, and we are thrilled. We have 296 Extension students taking this course online, which means they're going to watch videos, and then Extension students, you will be in sections on teleconference, where people are going to call in, and we're going to have teleconferences, which is going to be a great opportunity. Um, so let's say hi to people out there in New Zealand, hi. <laughs> Oops, France, sorry. Kentucky, Lexington. It's really, um, it's really unbelievable. So um, the other thing is, I want to take everyone's picture, actually. No pictures in the classroom. Okay, so I'm not going to be doing any lecturing, but if, since Tal and I have a very similar systematic style, if Tal is absent for any reason, I will be doing the lecture for you. Good. Um, the other is people who are in extension, I want you to um, be patient. We're going to get information out there as soon as um, we can. And you will all be sectioned in the next week or so. And we're thrilled to be here. Great. Thank you, Deb. So I want to start with um, a story, something that happened to me exactly two years ago, just about to the day when was the last time when I taught positive psychology. Um, as the semester started, it was a very stressful period. Also, my mentor, and the person who I'm, who I'm dedicating um, this class, as well as all my future positive psychology classes to, Philip Stone passed away uh, just the day before the class started. Very stressful period. Um, and I got sick. And I got very sick. And... Um, I somehow got through the class, you know, taught the Thursday class that started last, two years ago, I started Tuesday, so I taught the Tuesday somehow, Thursday, barely, completely drugged, you know, this lecture, made it through somehow, and then went home and couldn't fall asleep, I was in real pain, went to the doctors, that was um, on a Friday, Friday afternoon, just said, you know, I have to go, all the medication that I took didn't help, went to the doctors, had some blood tests, and finally, after days where I couldn't sleep because of pain, fell asleep. This was a Friday night. At midnight, there is a phone call. I don't hear it. I'm fast asleep. My wife picks it up. Tommy picks it up. And um, it's the doctor. And the doctor says to Tommy, the test results just came in. And I should get to the hospital now. She said to the doctor, you know, he just fell asleep. He hasn't slept for days. Can't it wait till tomorrow morning? And the doctor said no. And he has to go to Beth Israel because they have the best, um, um, the best labs for, um, for what he needs right now. And she doesn't elaborate anymore. Tommy wakes me up, retells me the story of what's happening. Somehow I get up. She can't take me to the hospital because David, at that time one-year-old, is asleep. We don't want to wake him up, so we, order, we get a cab to take me to Beth Israel. On the way, so this was a year after I was, we were no longer resident tutors in Leverett. We were in Concord Ave, driving up the Charles River, up Mem Drive, and then um, next to Harvard. I look at Harvard. I look at the beautiful river. It's very quiet, not many cars, just after midnight on a Friday night. 
And I can't help myself but think, what if there's something really terrible going on? I mean, why would they call me midnight to the hospital, Beth Israel insisting on just one specific hospital? There must be something really wrong, and my mind begins to wander. And I say, what if I only have a year left? What will I do in that year? And I become very sad because I think, you know, I won't see David grow up. I won't see any of, won't have any future children. Be careful up there. And, and I become very wistful and sad. And then I ask myself, okay, so professionally, what would I want to do in that last year? So I know personally exactly what I'll do. I'll spend all the time that I can with my family. But professionally, what, what do I want to accomplish in this year? And my immediate response was, I want to leave behind a coherent body of work, a coherent course introducing people to positive psychology. We arrive at the hospital. I have some more checks. It ends up being nothing too serious. They put me on antibiotics, and within a couple of days, um, I'm on the way to recovery. I want to share with you today, though, why. Why is it that the most important thing for me at that time, and still today, is to leave behind a coherent body of work about positive psychology, to introduce you to this wonderful field? Why positive psychology? Why is it its own field? Why is it not just, well, let's just study happiness, well-being as part of social psychology or clinical psychology? Why have so many scholars around the world united around this concept of a positive psychology? So this is what I want to do today. In the year 2000, research was done by David Myers. David Myers from Hope College. Some of you who have studied social psychology may have read his textbook. Um, did research looking at psychological abstracts. And what he looked at was the ratio between quote-unquote negative research and quote-unquote positive research. And here is what he found from 1967 to the year 2000. This was around the time when positive psychology started. What he found in the 33 years are over 5,000 articles on anger, 5,000 research articles on anger. He found over 41,000 research articles on anxiety and over 50,000 articles on depression. And then he looked at positive words, positive research. He looked for research on joy, and he found a staggering 415 studies. It does get better. He looked at research on happiness, and he found close to 2,000 articles on happiness in 33 years. Life satisfaction came out top, over 2,500 studies. Still, if you look at that, the negative studies versus the positive studies, the ratio that you get is 21 to 1. For every one article on some positive aspect, some positive element of life, well-being, satisfaction, joy, happiness, you get... 21 articles on depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, neurosis, and so on. Ratio of 21 to 1. Very depressing ratio, I must admit. In fact, it makes me very angry and um, anxious. <laughs> Studies focus on primarily on what doesn't work. Mostly on what doesn't work. And this is not a new phenomenon. Here is um, something from Abraham Maslow, whom we mentioned last time, talking about this phenomenon in 1954. The science of psychology has been far more successful on the negative than on the positive side. It has revealed to us much more about man's shortcomings, his illnesses, his sins, but little about his potentialities, his virtues, his achievable aspirations, or his psychological height. 
it is as if psychology had voluntarily restricted itself to only half its rightful jurisdiction, and that the darker, meaner half. So what does psychology study? I mean, the psychology concentrators here know that, and others probably guess that. So we study a lot of prejudice. We study a lot depression and anxiety. We study a lot, a lot about conformity. We study a lot about misjudgments and errors. Very much focusing on this aspect. And very little, again, ratio of 21 to 1, very little on the positive. And when I look at this ratio and I think about it, and again, this is 1954. Hasn't changed much since. And when I think about it and look, in, look into it, I think that psychology needs help. I really do. I mean, think about it on the, on the personal level. What if you had, what if you had a person who 21 hours in a day was depressed and one hour in a day felt good? Or one day feeling good and then 21 days feeling anxious and depressed? You would say that this person would need help. And the field, I think, needs help. But then the question becomes, is it the right analogy? I mean, should we look at it this way? Because, you know, the 21 ratio is unhealthy. Certainly would be so on an individual level. But it reflects reality in many ways. Because what we're seeing today, and there's more and more research showing that there is more and more depression around the world. That there is more and more anxiety. East, west, north, south around the world. And one could argue, people who argue for continuing to doing research in this area and for doing less in positive psychology is, well, we should be doing even more than the 21 to 1 ratio because we want to alleviate the anxiety and depression that people experience. Today, depression is 10 times higher than it was in 1960. Now, part of it is because there's more awareness, because we measure better but that's not all. It's also simply because objectively there is more depression. And one way of knowing that is that the most objective quote-unquote measure that we have is unfortunately suicide. And numbers have risen significantly around the world, not just in, um, not just in the United States, whether it's in China, whether it's in Australia, as well as here. The mean age for depression today is less than 15. Kids at a very young age are introduced to the information highway. And very often they're not prepared, not able to deal with it in an effective way. So when we look at this data, we say we do need more research to help people overcome depression, to help people overcome anxiety. And I don't want to belittle that. That is important. Extremely important. What I'm arguing, what I'm going to argue for is the shift of the pendulum so that it's no longer 21 to 1, so that there are more, many more studies in positive psychology. Not to the exclusion of, not at all. But just shifting the pendulum. How about here? In our local village. This article, I couldn't find a study that was more recent. This was published in 2004, Harvard Crimson. And the article says that in their six-month study of this, 80% of Harvard students experienced depression over the past year. Now, we're not talking about the regular ups and downs that most people have 10 times a day. I certainly do. We're talking about depression here for an extended period of time. 47% of Harvard students, according to this, and granted, this is not an academic study, but I will share with you an academic study in a minute, published in a, in a top-tier refereed journal. But what the Crimson has found in its survey is that 47% of Harvard students over the past year have experienced depression to the point of not functioning. So really so that they couldn't leave a home, they were really struggling to just basically get through the day. 47%. Now when people look at this, they say, well, of course, we need to focus more on psychopathology. 21 to 1, not enough. 30 to 1, 
sounds more like it. We see it around campuses. This is not peculiar to Harvard. Not at all peculiar to Harvard. Richard Caddison, who's the head of the mental health services here, in the New England Journal of Medicine, probably the leading journal in the field of medicine, recently published an article where he talked about a survey that was done in th- among 13,500 college students nationwide, different kinds of colleges, universities, state schools, private schools. And what they found in this very significant study was that 45% of college students nationwide over the past year have experienced depression to the point of not functioning. So at Harvard, the Crimson found 47. Nationwide, it was 45. Essentially identical. No significant difference among the two. This is a nationwide phenomenon. In this study, 94% of college students nationwide feel overwhelmed and stressed by everything that they have to do. 94%. I mean, these are supposed to be the best four years of our lives. Something's going on here. Now, this is not unique to the United States. I just recently came back from a tour. I was in, <clears throat> spent time in Europe, but in, in the UK, in France, spent a lot of time in, in China, and some time in Australia. In every one of these places, the governments are really concerned. University presidents are really concerned about the growing levels of depression, anxiety, and general mental disorder. Rise of suicide rates in all of these countries that I mentioned. So we have a global epidemic here. And once again, going back, so isn't the 21 to 1 ratio good? Isn't it important? Shouldn't it even be increased? How can we even think about studying happiness and well-being and love and, and joy? Shouldn't we first deal with the real pressing problem of depression, anxiety, neurosis, and so on. Some truth to that, but again, what I'm going to argue for in this class is that we do need to also, not only, not exclusively, not even necessarily primarily, we need to also focus on the positive. I'm going to talk about three reasons why we should do that. The first reason is that it is important to focus on what works because what works, or what we focus on rather, creates reality. And if we focus on what is working, we'll have more working in our world, more working in ourselves, more working in our, in our relationships. The second reason why positive psychology as an independent field of study, as a course in and of itself is important, is that being happy is not just the negation of happiness. It doesn't mean that if I just get rid of depression or anxiety that I'm experiencing, I spontaneously become happy. That's not the case. That's not how it works. And finally, prevention, which is very important today, the most effective ways of preventing hardship, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, is actually by focusing and cultivating the positive. And I will share some studies with you about this. So for these three reasons, we need a positive psychology. Let me begin with the importance of focusing on what works. In the introduction to the Handbook of Positive Psychology, Marty Seligman, whom we talked about last time, considered the father of positive psychology, network of scholars, says this. The aim of positive psychology is to catalyze a change in psychology from a preoccupation only with repairing the worst things in life to also building the best qualities in life. Note that he says also. He doesn't say exclusively or even primarily. It's important to focus on what works, whether it's in our relationship, whether it's in ourselves, whether it's in others, whether it's at Harvard, whether it's in the United States or the world, in order to have more of what works. Now, the question is, how do we get to focus on what works? And the answer to this question is through the questions that we ask. Let me illustrate through a case study. Psychologists starting 
in the late 1940s studied at-risk population. More and more money, government money, university money, philanthropist money went in to study inner cities or places where generally the kids were considered at risk, more prone to dropping out of school, more prone to later on crime, teen pregnancy, and so on. So they studied, they put in a lot of money, a lot of effort into this. And the question that the psychologist asked was, why do these individuals fail? Why does such a high percentage of students in the at-risk population, why do they end up dropping out of school, getting pregnant, crime? And we'll talk about the, the statistics later on uh, next week. Why do so many of these individuals fail? Now, an important question, good intentions of the psychologist, smart people, a lot of money, a lot of resources going in, However, very little change was introduced. Very little change came about as a result of these studies. And the situation in many areas continued to exacerbate. Certainly didn't get any better, despite the good intentions, despite the resources, despite the brain power that went into researching this question. Interesting answers, well, we need better education, we need better buildings, we need more resources, but very little change actually in practice came about. And then there was a paradigm, quite literally a paradigm shift in the 1980s through the work of Antonovsky, whom I mentioned last time and I'll mention again today, through the work of Antonovsky and other people like Alan Langer, other people like Alice Eisen, different questions started to be asked by psychologists. Instead of asking why do these individuals fail, positive psychologists started to ask what makes some individuals succeed despite unfavorable circumstances. It may be, it was the case that many failed, but not everyone. Some succeeded and succeeded big time. And what the psychologists started to do then was to ask why. What is it about them that is so successful? And that, in the words of Frost, made all the difference. The psychologist started to identify elements, aspects of these individuals and study them in depth, starting to study the successful individuals and identifying elements that they could then teach later and create interventions based on what they had studied. And suddenly there were results, real results, tangible results. After decades of virtually zero results, simply based on the question. And the main concept that came out at that time through the research of these psychologists who started to ask the positive question, started to focus on what is working on the successful children. The concept that came out was the concept of resilience. Now, today everyone talks about resilience. We talk about resilience uh, in school. We talk about resilience in, um, in, uh, at work. We talk about resilience in... Um, in the job, we talk about resilience in the bedroom, everywhere resilience. However, at that time in the 1980s, very few people even talked about or knew what that means. And when they studied resilience, which they defined as following, it made all the difference. Resilience, a class of phenomena characterized by patterns of positive adaptation in the context of significant adversity or risk. These kids who succeeded ended up succeeding and they looked through longitudinal studies. Five years later, 10 years, 30 years later, the kids who succeeded were resilient. Initially, when they studied these kids, the assumption was these must be super kids. Extraordinary kids, one in a hundred, one in a thousand, not really replicable, therefore. However, what they found when they continue to study those people who work, those people who succeeded despite the unfavorable circumstances, what they found was that these were not super kids. In fact, these were ordinary kids with ordinary characteristics that led to extra ordinary results. For example, let me share with you some of the things. These kids were optimistic. 
Not optimistic in the detached Pollyannish sense. Optimistic in that they, they believe that things would work out well. And we'll talk a lot about optimism as an interpretation style, relying on the work of Marty Seligman and Karen Rivich. They were optimistic in the sense of thinking, well, it may not have worked out this time. It will work out later. I have learned from what, just, what had just happened. They had faith and a sense of meaning in life. Sometimes it was religious faith. Faith, Not always. It was doing something that they really believed in. Many of them were idealistic. One of the, the, the t- main topics that we'll discuss in this class is that to be idealistic is to be realistic. Because we have a real internal need, innate need for idealism. So these kids experienced a sense of meaning, whether it was meaning in terms of personal success and how I will make it, or a sense of meaning in their community and contributing, but something that was meaningful, a sense of purpose. By the way, when I go through all these, these are no less important for any other person in the world. This resilience, as as we mentioned earlier, it's not just important for the at-risk population. It's as important at Harvard and not just during exam period. It's important. Resilience is associated with with well-being. So think about these characteristics and do you display them? And the interesting thing about all these characteristics that I'll mention here is that they can all be taught, they can all be learned. In many ways, this class is about that. And when the psychologists identified these, they started to teach them and the individual started to learn them and that made all the difference. In addition to faith and a sense of meaning, pro-social behavior, helping other people, shifting from helplessness to helpfulness. And that was significant. One of the things that we'll talk about is how meaningful it is to help other people and how much it doesn't just only help others, it also helps ourselves. And we enter an upward spiral between self-help and other help. Because when we help others, we're helping ourselves. When we help ourselves, we help others and so on and so on. So they were pro-social. They were helping other people. They focused on their strengths rather than primarily deficiencies. They did not ignore their weaknesses, but they asked, so what am I good at? What am I really, really good at? And again, as part of this course, you'll identify your strengths. Whether it's through online tests, whether it's through reflection papers, whether it's in section, you'll think about whether it's through your readings. Identifying the strengths, what they're good at. They set goals for themselves. They were future-oriented. Not just thinking about how bad things are today, perhaps, but also think about, this is where I want to be five years or ten years from now. We're going to devote three classes to goal setting. Very significant part of resilience. They had a role model. Someone whom they said about, I want to be like her. I want to be like him. It could be a teacher, it could be a parent, a sibling, a friend. Sometimes it was a a historical figure or a fictional character. Someone that they want to emulate, to be like. That gave them strength, that gave them a sense of direction. And finally, most significantly, most significantly, they did not bowl alone. They had social support. They did not say, well, I'm tough enough to do it by myself. Rather, they said, I'm tough enough to reach out for help. Because that does require certain toughness. The strength to admit weakness as well. The strength to admit, to admit a need. Now think about these things. Do you have these things here for yourself at Harvard in life, and if not, you can cultivate all of these things, whether it's a social support, whether, and and that doesn't have to be a hundred people whom you talk to every day, can be one or two close friends, mom, dad, roommates, makes a big difference, number one, contributor to resilience. Now, the important thing about social support is identifying the right people, people who when you reach out to them, will reach back to you, will be able to give back. And I want to show you an example now of a not-so-good role model for, um, for social support 
And that is an interaction between Grace and Karen from Will and Grace. So we Yeah. So Karen may not be a good choice for social support, but there are many people who are. Now, <clears throat> think about the power of the question. Think about what a question did. For decades, many kids who potentially could have been helped weren't helped because the right question was not asked as well. And it was only after the positive question, the focusing on the positive question was asked, that suddenly psychologists were able to see what was right in front of them for decades. It was right there, apparent, evident, waiting to be discovered. But they completely missed it. Smart, well-intentioned, well-funded, but didn't also ask the right question. Questions create reality. They create possibilities. A question begins a quest. What he did in positive psychology, and again, a great deal through the work of Antonovsky, was move us from the path pathogenic model to the salutogenic model. Salutogenesis, the foundation, the origin of health. And what Antonovsky was talking about, he said that it's important to study illness, mental illness, physical illness, but it's equally important to study the healthy people, the healthy individuals, to see how they make it. Whether it's people at Harvard, you know, Harvard is a stressful environment. However, there are some people who are able to go through it, to do well, to thrive, flourish, and while still going through the ups and downs, we all do, overall experience it as a more, much more positive experience, as a happy experience overall. How do they do that? Why? Well, what Antonovsky said is we need to study that so that we understand the origin of health. And he studied these things, and that made a big difference in the field as a whole. Quote Antonovsky. All those familiar with the history of science are aware that important advances come with the formulation of new questions. The question is the breakthrough. The answer comes with difficulty. But it is the new question that is important. The, the salutogenic question I submit to you, in other words, what is working, is a radically new question which provides the impetus for formulating a new paradigm to help us understand health and illness. It has serious implications for researcher and clinician, biological and social scientist alike. It was that question that essentially created the field of positive psychology, as well as positive sociology. He was a sociologist by training, as well as many other fields. Questions make a difference. Questions create reality. I want to do an exercise with you now. We'll do quite a few exercises in class. Here's the first one. To illustrate the importance of questions. Now, I'm going to ask you to count the number of geometric shapes that you see on the screen. No, not the screen, the next screen. I know Harvard students, it's fine. The next screen. I'm going to ask you to count the number of geometric shapes that you see on the screen. It's a very difficult question. I've given it to people around the world. I've given it to mathematicians, to artists who are very visual. And the challenge here is that you're only going to have 30 seconds in which to do it. 30 seconds to tell me how many geometrical shapes you see on the screen. Ready? 30 seconds. How many geometric shapes do you see? on the screen. Go.
Okay. So that was 31 seconds, so it should be no problem. Now, if you haven't done, I know a, few, a couple of you have done this exercise before, but if you haven't done this exercise before, and that's most of you, I'd like you to participate. So, how many geometric shapes could you count on the screen? Throw out the numbers. Six, eight, 48, 58, 44, 36, 110, 38. How many? Up there. You had a good, good perspective. Eight. Anyone more than 110? Anyone more than 110? Yeah, how many? 300? 200. Anyone more than 200 or less than six? Okay, so quite a range. Quite a range. You know, but I grant you that it's a tough question. By the way, if you have it on your um, PowerPoints that you downloaded, because I, I took it off the later downloading, but you may have downloaded it. Don't look at it now, please. So we have the ratio be rate between six and 200. Now, it's a tough question. In fact, it is so tough that I have no idea how many geometric shapes there are on the screen. But I have another question for you. Now, if you know the answer to this question, just put your hand up. And you haven't done this exercise before. Just put your hand out. Don't shout it out. If you know the answer, put your hand up. What time was it on the clock? What time was it on the clock? If you know the answer, put your hand up. If you think you know the answer, halfway up. Maybe, maybe quarter, and the rest of you may leave. No. <laughs> okay, so we have a few halves. Um, so out of a room, how many were? Probably 600, 700 students here. Out of 700 Harvard students, um, five and a half people can read the time on a clock. But I understand, we all have, we all have digital watches today. It's difficult. So let me ask you an, an easier question. If you know the answer, just put your hand up. That's right. <laughs> How many kids were visible on the bus? If you know the answer, put your hand up. If you think you know halfway up, maybe quarter. Yeah, most of you are thinking, what bus, you know? <laughs> what, what kids? Well, it was there. So, out of a room of, um, it's again, 700 Harvard students, there are approximately 11 and three quarters who can count. But that's okay, that's not math 55 here, I understand. Another question, a little bit easier. What was the color of the dominant color of the leftmost geometric shape on the screen. Not the big white screen, but the leftmost geometric shape on the screen. What was the dominant color? If you know the answer, hand right up if you think halfway. Okay, so that's about 12 and a quarter people. Now, according to my estimate and research, there are probably between five and seven people in this room who are colorblind. Really, according to statistics. The rest of you have no excuse. <laughs> Let's look. So, the time on the clock. Somewhat difficult, obscure. The time. It's ten after ten. All right, it's a bit difficult. Visible children on the bus. Here is the bus, for those of you who still can't see it. Five, and the color, the dominant color of the leftmost geometric shape, yellow. What happened? I mean, these are not very difficult questions. I mean, even the final in positive psych is going to be more difficult than that. I mean, really, a lot more. <laughs> Just. Why? Well, the reason is 
The reason is because I asked you a certain question and that question directed you to a certain part of reality. And that's a good thing because if we were focusing on everything all the time, that wouldn't be a good thing. We would be distracted by every single noise, by every single movement. So it's a good thing that we can focus. However, we also need to remember the consequences of this ability to focus that is not always good. It's not always helpful. Because as far as you were concerned, there were no children on the bus. As far as you were concerned, there were only geometric shapes. In other words, my question for most of you created a very specific reality. A reality in which there were geometric shapes and no, and no children on the bus. Now that has very important implications. Think about the following. Think about the following question. What question is mostly asked by couples beyond the honeymoon phase? So they go through the honeymoon phase, whether it's a month or a year or sometimes two years. What questions do they begin to ask after that period of time? What's wrong? What's not working? How can we improve the relationship? Now, that's a very important question to ask. Very important. But if that's the only question or the only questions that we ask, then that is the only thing that we will see. The only thing that we will see are the deficiencies, the things that are not working, the things that need to be improved, the weaknesses of my partner, of the relationship. If the only questions that I ask are, what is not working? What's wrong? What do I need to improve? And again, these are not questions that we need to do away with. They're important. However, if they're the only questions, and usually they're the only questions that are asked or primarily asked, then as far as the couple is concerned, not objectively, but as far as the couple is concerned, good things do not exist in the relationship. Just like as far as you're concerned, there were no children on the bus, even though they were right there in front of you, staring at you. But they did not exist. Or think about it on the individual level. This is very important. What is the question that we, most Americans, most Australians, most Chinese, most Israelis, most Europeans, Africans, what is the question that is mostly asked about the self? And this is the reason why I mentioned all these places is because this is cross-cultural study. People mostly ask about themselves, what are my weaknesses? What do I need to improve? Very often to the exclusion of what are my strengths, what are my virtues, what am I good at? And if the only question that we ask ourselves or the only questions are what are my weaknesses, deficiencies, then the only thing that we'll see in ourselves are weaknesses and deficiencies. And as far as we're concerned, the good things, our strengths, our passions, our virtues, the wonderful things within us do not exist. Just like as far as you were concerned, the children on the bus did not exist. Now I ask you, could a person who only or primarily focuses on weaknesses and does not see, does not appreciate the strength, their passions, their virtues, can a person like that experience high levels of self-respect, self-confidence, happiness and then we wonder why do so many relationships fail and then we wonder why depression and anxiety and low self-esteem are increasing so much the intentions are, are there they're good we are asking how can we improve what can we do better but if we don't also ask the positive question, that part of reality will not exist as far as we're concerned. Just like for the psychologists for a decade, the answer to their question, the solution to the problem that they wanted to solve did not exist, even though it was right there in front of their very eyes within the successful kids, within their resilience. Questions create reality. The questions that we ask very often determine the quest that we will pursue, the path that we will take, the life that we will lead, whether it's individually, whether it's interpersonally, 
whether it's organizationally. What is the question? Many of you I know are going into consulting. What's the question that most consultants ask, either explicit question or implicit question, the first time when they meet a client? What's wrong? What can we improve? What are the weaknesses that we need to strengthen? Again, important questions to ask. But if you only ask these questions, then you're ignoring the strengths, the virtues of the organization. And what you're doing, you're enervating, you're weakening the organization over time. It is as important, if not more important, to also appreciate what is working organizationally, interpersonally, as well as individually. It is important to appreciate what is good. I mean, look at the word appreciate. Two meanings. First meaning, to say thank you for something, not to take it for granted. And that's a nice thing to do. We shouldn't take for granted our virtues, our successes. We shouldn't take for granted others. That's a nice thing to do. But appreciate has a second meaning, which is to grow. Money appreciates in the bank. The economy hopefully appreciates. When we appreciate the good, the good appreciates, the good grows. Unfortunately, the other side of the same coin applies as well. When we don't appreciate the good, when we take it for granted, the good depreciates. And that's what happens in most relationships after the honeymoon phase. That's what happens to most people, especially to very driven people who want to improve, who want to get better. And that's a good thing, if that is what makes you happy. At the same time, it's equally important to also appreciate what is good inside me, what my strengths, what my virtues are. And we're going to do a lot of that in the course. And again, not to go to the point of narcissism. If anything, narcissism, and we'll talk about it in the second last lecture of the semester, narcissism is not about self-confidence, about self-esteem. It's the exact opposite. We're talking about grounded self-confidence, grounded, generous, benevolent happiness. And in order to lead that kind of life, we need to also appreciate what is working, to also focus on, metaphorically speaking, the children on the bus. Stavros and Taurus, in the wonderful book on relationships, we see what we look for and we miss much of what we are not looking for, even though it is there. Our experience of the world is heavily influenced by where we place our attention. Questions very often create reality. The first important thing to understand about questions is that we need to understand the questions. And here I want to defer to a very important philosopher, um, 20th and 21st century philosopher, um, who illustrates the importance of understanding questions. Homer Simpson. You can just turn down the voice, the, the sound a little bit because this is very loud, Barry. Thank you. We're going to run a few tests. This is a simple lie detector. I'll ask you a few yes or no questions and you just answer truthfully. Do you understand? Yes. <laughs> love it, love it. So, so the first step is really understanding the question. But once we understand it, it is also important to know what questions are we going to ask. I mentioned earlier that one of the most important things in cultivating resilience is having a role model. I want to share with you now my role model. In fact, the person who is the reason why I decided to become a teacher. Her name is Marva Collins. Marva Collins was born in Alabama in the 1930s. Her father was African American, her mother Native American. She was born at a time and a place where there was a great deal of discrimination. Fortunately for Marva, her father really believed in her and said to her, 
from a very young age, Marva, you can make something of your life. You can become a secretary. Now, the reason why he said secretary is because that is where the glass ceiling, or rather the concrete ceiling, existed for a person of her ethnic background, a person of her gender. Marva Collins worked hard, she was smart, she succeeded and she made it and she became a secretary. After a few years working as a secretary, doing well, she decided this was not for her and what her calling in life, her real passion, was in teaching. She wanted to be a school teacher. She went to night school, a few years later got her teaching certificate, got married and with her husband moved to Chicago. There she joined the public school system in inner city Chicago. The reality that she found, that she encountered there, was a reality of much crime, much drugs, and more than anything, hopelessness. The hope of the teachers was to keep the students in school for as long as possible. Why? So that they don't join street gangs at the age of 12, so that they are protected from drugs and from crime. How can we keep these students in school for as long as possible, asked the teachers. Marva Collins walks into this reality and says things are going to be different. On the first day of class, and she teaches first graders to fourth graders, on the first uh, day of class, She says to her students, we are going to do a lot of believing in ourselves. And she repeats this message over and over and over again like a broken record throughout the semester and year and years. I believe in you. You can do well. You can succeed. Take responsibility for your life. Stop blaming. Stop blaming the government. Stop blaming your teacher. Stop blaming your parents. It is up to you to succeed. And she continues with this message over and over and over again, having really high expectations of her students, looking at what they're good at, at their strengths, and cultivating those. Miracles begin to happen. These students, considered by many of the teachers to be, quote, unteachable, unquote, These unteachable ones, by the time they are in fourth grade, are reading Euripides, Emerson, and Shakespeare. These unteachable ones, at the age of 10, are doing high school mathematics. Now, rumors begin to spread about Marvel Collins, because after all, how can she keep these students in class for so long? When all the other students, you know, just try and get away from school, she must be using force. And Marva Collins has enough of these rumors, leaves the public school system, opens up her own school in her own kitchen with four students. Initially, two of them her own kids. Gradually, more and more students joined the Marva Collins School, West Side Preparatory, she calls it. All the students that initially joined the school are public school dropouts. Marva Collins is their last resort before the street. And the miracles continue. Gradually, more and more students come in. She has to move out of her home. She rents a small shack in Chicago, freezing in winter, scorching hot in summer. And yet the students are driven by their passion. And they continue. Miracles continue to happen too. Every one of Marva College students graduates from elementary school. Everyone goes to high school and graduates from high school. Every one of her students ends up in college and graduates from college. Yes, those unteachable ones. Marva Collins lives in dire poverty for decades, somehow making ends meet. After all, most of her students can't pay. But somehow, month to month, she makes it. 1979, it changes overnight. A producer from the television CBS program, 60 Minutes, finds out about Marva Collins and creates a 15-minute segment on her. Overnight, she becomes famous. 
November 1980, new president-elect Ronald Reagan calls up Marva Collins, offers her to be his secretary of education. So I guess her father was right. <laughs> Marva Collins turns his offer down and says, I love to teach too much. My place is in the classroom. Eight years later, almost to the day, new president-elect George Bush Sr. calls Marva Collins up once again, offering, offering her to be his secretary of education. Once again, I love to teach too much. My place is in the classroom. In 1995, a wealthy philanthropist donates tens of millions of dollars to Marva Collins. Now there are Marva Collins schools all over the country where thousands of students learn, where hundreds of teachers from all over the world come and see the miracle of Marva Collins. Today there are Marva Collins graduates who are politicians, business people, lawyers, doctors, and more than anything, teachers, because they know what a teacher has done for them. I want to show you a brief excerpt of this extraordinary woman. If you can turn the volume up a little bit, Barry, please. This is soft. I think I am pretty wonderful. I think I am bright. I think I am unique. Uh, and I teach every child in here to think that. When they misbehave, their punishment is they have to write 100 reasons why they are too wonderful to do what they're doing. And that and they have to be in alpha order. I'm adorable. I'm beautiful. I'm courageous. I give them the first ones until they get the hang of it. I'm delightful. Uh, I'm effervescent. Uh, I'm fabulous. I'm heavenly. I'm idolized. I'm just wonderful. I'm a kindred spirit. I am laudable, I am momentous, or I am never, never indolent, and it goes on to Z. And if they do it again, then they have to use another synonym. They can't use adorable anymore. Now the children will say to new students, I don't know why you don't behave, because I'm tired of telling Mrs. Collins how wonderful I am. Now she's wonderful. Here is her book. Now, for all those of you, and I know there are quite a few of you who are interested in teaching, and there is one book you want to read, it's this. For all those of you who are interested in leadership, and there is one book you want to read, it's this. For all those of you who are or are interested in the future of becoming parents, and there is one book you want to read, it's this. For all the rest of you, if there is one book you want to read. <laughs> so what's her message? What's her message? First of all, she herself is the message as a role model. And she studies with her kids role models. They read fiction books. They read historical books. They read books about heroes and talk about heroes. They all identify role models. They identify role models in their neighborhood, in their families, constantly doing that, which is exactly what you need to cultivate resilience. But first and foremost, she herself is the role model. She has high expectations. We're going to do a lot of believing in ourselves. We're going to do well, succeed. She expects a lot. She sees the potential she appreciates that potential in each individual. Stop blaming others. Take responsibility for your life. Marva Collins is no pushover. If you see her in the classroom, she's tough. She's demanding. At the same time, she respects each individual's individual. She's not one of the Pollyannish feel-good, let's make them all feel good at all costs. Not at all. She believes in them, she respects them, and she's tough and demanding. An important combination for leadership. 
which is why I mentioned it earlier in the context of a, le- a great leadership book. There are many very nice ex-CEOs whose primary aim was to be nice and to be liked. The key is to get the job done, to get the work done while being respectful. Sense of optimism. You can do well, you are going to do well, helping them set goals for themselves and for the community. And finally, from focusing on deficiencies to focusing on strengths. Howard Gardner from the Ed School here talks about multiple intelligences, says that we need to stop asking whether or not a student is smart. What we need to ask is, what is the student smart at? And when we identify what that student is smart at, strong at, virtuous at, good at, then we appreciate it. And when we appreciate it, it and the whole person appreciates. What would happen to a seed? A seed is a potential. Flower, tree. What happens to a seed if it is not watered, if no light is shed on it? It will wither and die. The exact same thing with human potential. If we don't water it, if we don't shed light on it, it will wither and die. The same with interpersonal relationship potential. If we don't want, and we'll talk a lot about relationships, how to cultivate healthy long-term relationships. If you don't water, if you don't shed light, if you don't appreciate the good, the good will depreciate. Essentially, What Marva Collins does is create for her students, and what the research in resilience does is create a very different model than the conventional wisdom. The paradigm shift essentially is from being a passive victim, well, it's because the government is not putting enough money, which is an issue, not belittling it. It's important to have those external affect the internal, like more resources, but that's not enough. From an active, from a passive victim, she changes their perspective to being active agents. You're not unteachable. You can thrive. You can do well. You can succeed. And what she does, essentially, is take them to the extreme of a continuum because every event, every person can be situated somewhere along this continuum and in different places where different things. And think about your own life. What are you? Passive victim? in different situations, or an active agent. For example, let's say my girlfriend leaves me. I know when I was an undergrad here, this was top on my mind. Girlfriend's leaving me. Yes, we'll talk about that later in the semester when we get to know one another a little bit better. I feel a bit shy at this point. But let's say my girlfriend leaves me. If I'm the passive victim... What I experience is self-pity, feel sorry for myself, ruminate, remember the word ruminate, about the situation and how terrible it is. If I'm a passive victim, I then move to blame. She's terrible, it's her fault. I blame her, I blame my parents for the way they raised me, I blame her parents, I blame you know, President Bush or whom, whomever. And after I blame, I experience frustration as well as anger. Anger toward her, anger toward my parents, her present, President Bush, you know, Hillary, whoever it is, I feel anger. And results? Very few results. Because I wallow in rumination and self-pity. Now let's take the other extreme of the active agent. First of all, by definition, I take action. I take responsibility. I go out to places, you know, after experiencing the pain and it's painful, and next time we're going to talk about the importance of experiencing the pain, of giving ourselves what I call the permission to be human. But once I experience that, I take action. I go out there to places where I will meet someone. I go to Pinocchio's (laughs) or another meeting place, the Stacks in Widener. And... Well, I guess things have changed at Harvard since I was an undergrad, but I take responsibility for it. And then as a result of that, and we'll talk about research on 
self-perception theory, research by Daryl Bem, and we'll talk a lot about it. You don't need to write it down now. How taking action will actually increase our levels of confidence. And then more hope and optimism as a result. And as we'll talk about the beliefs of self-fulfilling prophecy lecture, hope and optimism become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm much more likely to find someone. I'm certainly much more likely to be, to be happy. Once again, being an active agent does not mean not giving ourselves the time, the space, the permission to experience painful emotions, to go through the motion. Yes, by all means, we go through it. However, what it is also saying is that we need to find the right time. It could be immediately. It could be a day or two later to take action, to take responsibility, to do things so that our confidence levels and our hope and optimism increase. I want to just say a few things about this idea of being an active agent and responsibility. It applies to your life here at Harvard. It is up to you. It is your responsibility to make the most of your Harvard experience. It is your responsibility to make the most out of this class. We, the teaching staff, are certainly going to create the conditions for it. We're going to support you in every way that you need. However, ultimately, it's your responsibility to do it in section it's your responsibility to make it. And one of the first questions that you'll be asked in question in section next week when, when they start to meet is, how can you make this an excellent section? What can you do? What can you bring? What strengths can you bring into this section so that it's an excellent section? As opposed to blaming other students, TF, Bush, Clinton, whoever. Taking responsibility for it. There's a wonderful story about responsibility in the book by Nathaniel Brandon. We're going to read some stuff by Nathaniel Brandon when we talk about self-esteem. Nathaniel Brandon talks about six pillars, six important pillars of self-esteem. One of those pillars is self-responsibility. People who have high self-esteem take responsibility. People who want to cultivate high self-esteem and create confidence take responsibility for their lives, and so on. So in his workshop, one of the main things that he says there and in his book is that understanding that you have to take responsibility for your life is recognizing, understanding that no one is coming. That no one is coming. No one is coming to you know, the, the, the knight in shining armor who will take you to the happily ever after land. No one is coming to make your life better for you. No one is coming. You are responsible for your life, for your self-confidence, for your self-esteem, for your happiness. No one is coming. So he was talking about this in one of his workshops. That was, that's a three-day workshop, and this was already on the, um, on the third day, and the workshop was going well, and the, the participants were getting a lot out of it. And he said, he told them about this idea that no one is coming, and one of the participants raises his hand up and says, Dr. Brandon, that's not true. And Nathaniel Brandon asked him, what do you mean? And he says, Dr. Brandon, you came. To which Brandon responded, yes, I came, but I came to tell you that no one is coming. <laughs> no one is coming. It's up to you to make the most out of this experience, 1504, your sections, your Harvard experiences, and beyond. And we, as the teaching staff, can't wait to create the right conditions for that to happen. See you on Thursday.